Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to address the committee in connection with this bill. The discussion thus far has focused on events that took place a long time ago. And sadly, I just want to remind everybody that we really are dealing with a present tense problem. You know, tomorrow on my calendar, I'm going to sit with a pair of nice parents, live in Warwick, a child who was molested by a teacher in Warwick in a <coughs> private school. And they have to grapple with a question that I don't think any parent really would ever want to have to grapple with, which is, are they going to initiate litigation when it's clear that the statute of limitations is not blown and watch their teenage child potentially devolve before their eyes as that child withstands cross-examination and the attack that the defense will almost certainly mount because in my experience that's what they do, they attack the victim. Or are they going to wait and then they're going to find out whether or not this young man at say age 19 or 20 will choose to take that battle on himself. And exactly how much time are you, you people, going to give those parents and that child to make that decision? I mean, I've got children who are in their 30s. And I think any of us know that the age of 18, although it may constitute emancipation, doesn't cut the cord. The age of 21, which is old enough to drink, does not mean that your child does not need parental care. They're not in the same way, but they haven't reached adulthood in any meaningful fashion. And it would be wonderful, I suppose, if all of us as parents didn't have to think about what was going on with our quote, child, who is now an adult seven years after they've reached the age of majority. But that's just not the way the world works. And if your child was sexually abused at age 16 a couple of years ago, and that child is 18 now, that clock's ticking. And I can tell you that in many instances, people simply will not bring an action because it's more important to get the kid through college without a nervous breakdown, without slash wrists, without anorexia, okay, than it is to hold the persons who perpetrated the abuse against that child accountable. So you have a problem. You have a problem that you have a predators out there, predators who associate themselves with powerful institutions who use the positions of power that those institutions give them to feed sexually upon children. It's what they do. That's how they gratify their sexual needs. So we can be polite about it. And we can talk about statutes of limitations. We can talk about protecting children. And if you want to protect children, then you don't like statutes of limitations around this particular issue. Because that is the first line of defense for these institutions and the first line of defense for the perps. Those perps are operating from a position of power and that power is palpable when you sit and talk. Now I'll go backwards. I was talking about something that happened relatively recently. But when you're sitting and talking with a 25 or a 30-year-old person and you see how it, impossible for that person it would have been to have opened their mouth in the day. I have had clients who have been married by the priest that molested them for the simple reason that Father Bob was so tight with the family that there was no way that Father Bob wasn't going to do the wedding. And when mom says, of course, Father Bob's going to do the wedding, 
The kid can't open his mouth because he never said anything back in the day when he was 13, and he kept his mouth shut through high school and college, and he just can't bring himself to say something to the parents today. So he walks down the aisle and stands there with a wife, or soon-to-be wife, to have a marriage ceremony done by a person who abused him at age 13. That's incapacitation. When you are so distraught, twisted, really, your mind is so twisted by a perpetrator that you are literally incapable of speaking up. <laughs> because otherwise, why in God's name would you have someone who sexually abused you marry you? So I have seen this firsthand in, in young people where I'm representing someone who's 9, 10, 11, 12. I've seen this firsthand in 40 and 50 year olds who have to grapple with the problem. And I would just politely suggest that as, as much as we may not like litigation and, and it, you know, when a lawyer comes before a committee asking for a bill, you know, or in support of a bill, you know, the first question that people I'm sure ask is, you know, what is their, their business motive behind it? Okay, I've got plenty of business. I'd love to not have sexual abuse cases. So as soon as we could get rid of sexual abuse, I'll be fine not bringing those claims. But let me tell you, if you want to get rid of sexual abuse, getting rid of the statute of limitations, which is the primary weapon in the defense of the people who are perpetrating it and causing it to be either not detectable or not prosecutable, is the statute of limitations. There is no doubt in my mind that the litigation that, that I've been able to be a part of and that, that, that my profession has brought, I'm quite proud, frankly, of having put a dent in the problem, okay? Woken people up generally because institutions lived in denial. You know, when, when, when they speak about St. George's, they speak about the Catholic Church, these victims were completely disenfranchised from our legal system and from any form of redress. So when you open the doors to the courts, you bring public attention to a problem which is a significant threat and has been, frankly, for decades if not centuries. So the more brightly the light of day is shined upon this problem and the statute of limitations is a door that shuts that light out. But the more brightly the light is shined, then the less these people will be able to get away with it. And it's exactly what they've used. They've used this to get away on the perp end with the perpetration, but then on the back end with the, admi the administration or the hierarchy as one of these victims so astutely called it, it's a form of denial and avoidance because the last thing they want to hear from is somebody like me. And they're more than willing to move someone to Maine or New Hampshire or Warwick or wherever they think they can stuff that person out of sight, out of mind, knowing full well that he is going to, in all probability, simply continue to feed. So 80 victims does not surprise me. 100 victims does not surprise me per perpetrator. Who, whatever you can do to change that statute and allow persons like myself to hold these institutions accountable is going to benefit the children that you have today and those who were victimized in the past. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, Representative Craven. Tim, what's the statute of limitations on a breach of contract? I believe it's 10 years. Interesting Thunder's choice here, of priorities, 20. wouldn't you say? <laughs> Unfortunately, the legal system, legal system has long protected commercial rights in a way that's different than the way that it protects persons. Well, <clears throat> I, I, I don't profess to be the conscience of society, but uh, 
I think you'd be pulling the covers over your head if you didn't think that somehow uh, some poor choices were made when they were handing out statute of limitations for cause of action. Well, I, I do know people who do personal injury work, and I understand the mindset that there's a three-year statute of limitations, and then you get into minority tolling, which is the backdrop. And, and what makes sense in an auto accident is one thing. I'm not an auto accident kind of guy. I don't do that kind of work, you know. But, but what I know is that if you're in an auto accident or your child is in an auto accident, comparing that to sexual abuse is like comparing an apple, an orange, or an apple to a nuclear war. They really have nothing to do with each other. Mm. Because the fact that you had that unfortunate auto accident or that the doctor, you know, did something wrong, if you will, medically, okay, is not something that visits, as Anne was referencing and one of the other survivors was referencing, that kind of shame. And it's the shame that silences these people. It's the embarrassment. It's the insanity of the perpetrator's manipulation that literally convinces the person that they can't say anything, shouldn't say anything, and in fact there's absolutely nothing wrong with the fact that he has his hand underneath a school teacher case, which was prosecuted by the AG's office when you were there, where the school teacher was literally molesting the children, sitting, uh, multiple children concurrently, but one child at a time, sitting in his lap in front of the classroom with his hands under the desk fondling a child. So the child, I mean, with the, he's a third grader. What in God's name is that child supposed to be doing when he's sitting in the teacher's lap in front of an entire classroom of people? Okay? If I grab this guy over here, in front, yeah, this is not going to work. Okay? But if you're a crazy sick teacher who's played to the crowd with the kids and worked the audience to get them to feel like he's such a nice guy, is now doing this really bizarre thing that doesn't seem really that right. How many third graders have got what it takes to, get, to be able to rat that out live? And they're much more common in that particular instance, the principal, when he got what was amounted to, I think, the fourth or fifth complaint, still asked the teacher to come down and explain it to the child and the child's mother. And when the teacher told the ch child's mother that it was all a misunderstanding and he's just, you know, checking the kid's pocket and making sh for the homework and stuff, you know, and the principal encouraged the teacher to take the kid and the mother home in their car. So the messages that our institutions send are horrific. They didn't if effectively muzzle the kid in the sense of put a, a gag over his mouth, but you might as well have if the third graders found a way to say, Mr. So-and-so's got his hands on me, and the next thing you know, the school principal is telling you to go home in the car with him and make nice. Might as well tell that third grader, knock it off, quit your complaining, and there you go. So from my point of view, if you want to protect children, the statute of limitations is just, it, what makes sense in auto accidents and doctor cases just does not make sense with child sexual abuse. Thank you.